This is Defenders TV Podcast, Episode 66, looking at Daredevil, Season 2, Episode 10, The Man in the Box. Welcome back, Defenders, to this episode of Defenders TV Podcast, looking at episode 10 of Daredevil, The Man in the Box. Uh, we are joined by a very, very special guest today. Uh, but before we introduce him, I am one of your hosts, John. I am one of your other hosts, Derek. And rounding out the trio, our very special guest. It's me again! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Welcome uh... back, Chris! Hey, it's not my fault. I was you threw me away after Civil War. Okay, I'm just, saying. <laughs> just basically, our our own Avengers defenders broke apart. Mm-hmm. He was binned, and then we decided to recycle. <laughs> Much like the Winter Soldier, I am back from the ice. There you go. Absolutely, yes. Our our own internal uh, dynamics all clashed. We couldn't have uh, have two Iron uh, Iron Man uh, proponents on the podcast, so we got rid of Chris. Yeah, makes sense. Are you an Iron Man <laughs> proponent? I am. 100%. Ah, okay, excellent. Yeah. Thank God, we're we're we've got numbers now this time, Chris. Yeah, we've got numbers. That's true. Still team cap forever. Mm. Okay, Captain Blue Eyes. But <laughs> <laughs> but we will be talking about Civil War at the end of the podcast. So don't worry if you haven't seen Civil War. Uh, you can skip off before the end of that. We will be talking about Daredevil well beforehand. Chris, the other thing you also missed was obviously Daredevil episode nine. Mm-hmm. What did you think of that episode? I had to say, it's not a Daredevil story until Nelson and Murdoch split up at some point. Absolutely. It was just like, yay, it's happening. Now it's really <laughs> Daredevil. Look at them split up. It Yay. is. It was just like, oh. Um It was a really, I have to admit, it was a tremendous outing for this season. Mm-hmm. Um, and like the whole season so far has been this kind of like complex ride and it's weaving a lot of stories, which not a lot of shows can do, um, especially when you start introducing additional characters like, and it can get very crowded. So Fisk can stick in there. But they're doing it in a great way that they're doing, like giving these characters pretty much like one, one or two episodes max. Like yeah. you just throw them in, get their their chunk of the story in their arc, and then pull them out. So they're because if you haven't had stick for the whole series, you'd be like, yeah, like, and we've seen Fisk. We've had. I love D'Onofrio. We've t- talked about it many, many, many times. Mm-hmm. But um, I I think this. This series is more about Daredevil and Elektra and the Hand. So having... It made sense to have him in where he is now with the Punisher. But it just didn't make sense to give him too much. Um, so, But despite being in jail, Fisk mm. isn't ruined. Yay! <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, they've done a yeah. great job of them. And without getting into secondary episodes, um, I'm still calling it. This is just setting up Born Again. The Born Again arc from the comic books. This is because obviously a scene in episode 10 kind of just goes, mm, yep, that that's straight out of the comic books. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll definitely be talking about that one. Yeah. Mm. But yeah, there haven't been a huge amount of Easter eggs in the last couple of episodes. No. If you found any Easter eggs that we've missed, obviously, listeners, you can email us at feedback at defenderstvpodcast.com and send those in to us. Or you can come and join us over in our Facebook group. Just go to facebook.com slash groups slash defenderstvpodcast. Join the group and share any thoughts about all the episodes of Daredevil or anything else that we cover on the podcast. And of course, in conjunction with Chris's thoughts on episode nine in episode 65 of Defenders TV podcast, or indeed, um, our thoughts on Civil War, uh, episode 64. You can obviously go to Defenders TV podcast.com forward slash iTunes, um, and subscribe and listen to us there. Uh, indeed, as well, any cat. Oh, indeed, any Team Cap or Team Iron Man uh, podcast catcher, uh, such as Beyond Pod, Player FM, or Podcast Addict, just search Defenders TV Podcast. Absolutely, and also if you want to see our lovely faces, uh, you can catch myself <laughs> and Chris on our on our uh, Civil War spoiler free uh, video over on YouTube. Uh, you can also catch myself and John doing our full spoiler filled podcast about a, about an hour and a half, I think, on that one, uh, where you'll see our lovely faces uh, chatting all about Civil War, which we will come back to after this episode. But I think it's time to get into this episode of Daredevil. I think it is. 
I think it is too. Well, episode 10 of Daredevil Season 2, The Man in the Box, was directed by Peter Hoare. Uh, he has directed an episode before uh, of this season. He's directed uh, Penny and Dime, and he's also set to direct the finale of the series as well. So uh, obviously in good hands for this episode. Uh, lots of writers uh, on this one. Uh, it's written by Whit Anderson and Snea Course, who did the teleplay, and John C. Kelly, who did the story, uh, all involved in the writer's room. But this is their episode all working together. Um, lots of different elements to to take care of in this episode probably the reason why so many of the writers got a got a major credit on it um john do you want to tell us what they gave us this episode yeah absolutely after daredevil's confrontation with naboo he arranges through detective mahoney treatment for the children harvested of their blood at metro general hospital at the same time new york city is on high alert after the punisher walks from prison and none more so than District Attorney Reyes, who orders Nelson, Murdoch, and Page into her office to get information on Castle that may keep her family alive. However, as Reyes and Blake Tower reveal the truth about the carousel gunfight and the role of law enforcement, a firestorm of bullets riddles her office, killing Reyes and injuring Foggy. With Foggy hospitalised, Karen and Matt search for Frank Castle in very different ways. Matt confronts Wilson Fisk in a desperate attempt to learn more of his involvement in Frank Castle's escape, but is reminded all too readily of the Kingpin's commitment to settling scores and violence. And Karen's suspicions that the attack on Ray's and the city medical examiner doesn't fit Castle's MO are confirmed as she is saved by Castle from a similar attack by an unknown shooter. As Foggy begins to recover, Daredevil returns to the hospital to protect the children drained of blood from retribution by the hand. But the children have also recovered and are awake. Awake to an unrepressed and violent power. Whew, there is so much going on at the moment in these episodes that it is um, a lot to try and... Um, boil down into a synopsis yeah, like well, it's well done, mental <laughs> there's so many different uh threads now running through i mean i've hardly even touched on the fact that claire temple is like in in this episode in in a pretty cool and distinct way as well so um you know loads of stuff happening at the moment in these episodes Absolutely, yeah. That kind of leads me straight into my first point. <laughs> yeah. Well done, John. Nice setup. Nice setup. Um, yeah, the way we cover our episodes, if this is your first time joining us for our Daredevil episodes, is we catch our top five points from the episode. Some good, some bad, some indifferent. Uh, call them out, discuss them amongst ourselves. Hopefully, we'll get to cover the full episode by discussing us through those five points. So my first one is, again, Claire Temple. I think I've called her out as one of my points each time she's appeared on screen. And that's really because I absolutely love the actress. I love that she's our binding force in the universe of The Defenders, the one that's appeared in every show so far. Uh, Daredevil Season 1, Jessica Jones, she's definitely going to be a big part of Luke Cage. And we're seeing her in, in Daredevil Season 2. So um, really great to see her back again. I love that. Love the position that Matt puts her in in this episode, where he effectively says, she calls it out actually, uh, she says they're going to come back and kill the kids and the people that helped them, aren't they? But it doesn't stop her. She's obviously going to take care of the kids. That's her job. Um, I love how confident she is and I love how powerful she is and how strong she is as a character in the show. Definitely. Uh, I like the fact that she puts it to Matt about why doesn't he go and see his friend who's just downstairs rejoin the human race? Something that yeah, she absolutely. says. I think something that she was talking in, in our coverage of Jessica Jones, uh, something that she talked about with Luke Cage and Jessica trying to push away the normal people in their lives. Uh, this seems to be something very central to, to Claire Temple's character, that she wants to make sure all of these heroes are grounded by the people around them, uh, which I thought was quite cool. Yeah, absolutely. I'm totally with you on this. Um, I think um, it was certainly one of my points, um, and I've said it before, like you've said, um, she's really good. She's this really amazing connective glue between um, all these different shows, but also just within this show. Um, I love her relationship with Matt. She injects like a huge amount of humor into it. You know, she says, um, you know, I'm not pleased to see you when they first meet early on in the episode. Um, and I, she goes, I forgot you like to, to suffer. Um, too bad because the, the hospital coffee takes tastes absolutely crap right. you know and um, all this thing um and i think even to the the accountant she goes don't worry billing will find you um you know when he says how can i ever repay you <laughs> like it's really just a really nice injection of like wit and humor there which I really really like um and to me as well she just 
at this moment in time articulates my feelings about Matt Murdock. Um, I mean, you know, she says, stop being the loneliest soldier, come down and say hi to your friend. Yeah. You know, essentially be a human, not a superhero. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the more you wear that suit of armor, the more you, um, divest yourself from those things you're trying to protect and that's the thing i'm getting at the moment i feel like i'm actually as an audience member growing apart from matt murdoch i think um you know for me i'm team foggy at the moment um i'd be seriously pissed as well if i was uh being shot at being shot uh having to do all the legwork on on, on the court case and, and i love that you know we really um we see that fracture again just after he's been shot when you expect Matt to actually be helping his friend. Mm-hmm. Um, you go, Foggy kind of says, you never know when to stop. And Matt arrogantly says, I'm not asking for permission. You know, and when Karen asks, where is Matt? He goes, why ask me? Um, you know, it's a real significant thing for me and to me that Foggy and Matt's relationship is at its absolute lowest here. Yeah. And I think Claire really articulates that, you know, Matt needs to make amends here. Um, and that for me chimes with how I'm thinking about Matt Murdock at the moment. So that was a great aspect of Claire Temple, um, in this episode. Um, I think she really shone that light onto, uh, Matt Murdock and Daredevil really he loves to suffer. Yeah. And, you know, it really is the Catholic guilt thing. <laughs> Certainly. I think uh, my, she has my favourite line in the episode as well, where she gives him some aspirin and, and calls it Catholic, Catholic morphine. Oh, Effectively, so you, <laughs> you can't take something more powerful. You have to have the guilt and the pain uh, inside you. So just have some aspirin. I like that little touch. Uh, Chris, <laughs> any thoughts on Claire? Yeah, yeah, no, that scene was standout for me. It really was. And I think it's. Um, yeah, it's the Matt, Matt finding himself kind of adrift in that with the way that he's ready to almost give up on like his career and his personal life completely. Mm-hmm. Um, all to stop the hand and their diabolical plan. He kind of overdid it somewhat, kind of in the dramatic kind of elements of that portrayal, but it was still fantastic. Mm-hmm. He's finally gone along with the advice that was given to him uh, when he was, what, nine years old by Stick, where it's, you can't have any friends, you can't have anybody if you're going to be involved yeah. in this war, and he's finally coming around to that idea, even though he's kicked Stick out of his life. Exactly, which, which I think, like, so it, this is kind of a bit of the, uh, what, some of the disconnect I was kind of getting, like, so Claire's, she didn't change Matt's mind at all. No, uh, absolutely. It's just like, he's, he won't listen to reason, but her voice is I think John and I agree with you. Her voice is the necessary one here because yeah. you're not getting it from Foggy. And they're basically almost trying to paint Matt into this, the the fall before the, the, the builds to greatness almost. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, and although in his defense, I will say this. If he had gone down to Foggy at that one point, the ending scene of that uh, of the episode would have been completely different because he would not have seen the hand run scaling up or heard them Very scaling true. up. That is true. And like, yeah, he did have a point. <laughs> and like, I I kind of now see where he's coming from. Uh, but no, it was it was a really good. It was really really good scene. It's just I think I'm slightly biased now towards the end of this episode. Yeah, but having said that. You know, he could hear the, the, the cock of the gun going, um, just before, obviously, that huge, um, shootout in Ray's, uh, Ray's office. Mm-hmm. So he should have been able to hear, uh, clamps oh, hitting the the top of the building even if he was inside well now you hear that the, you see that foggy hears that and so does claire so surely matt could be able to hear yeah. that yeah 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 okay so he still could have gone down like but i agree like i mean it, it works that he's up on the top yeah. of the hospital and mm-hmm. certainly um you know it just shows how incredibly stubborn this guy is like he's he the guardian a slap. devil you know he needs a clip around the <laughs> well ears, no that's like, it, like quite frankly they're, they're trying to make his character so anti-hero almost at this point because you, you, you'd you love to hate him because you're like he's daredevil he's amazing he's really shit to his friends <laughs> and he's exactly. actually yeah. not really good at his job right now and he basically is stringing two women along and um, yeah, he's just not a nice guy right now but we love him because he's daredevil and he's kicking ass ninjas and I, <laughs> I just wonder whether you know 
you're saying, you know, it's the fall before he maybe comes up and achieves greatness, or whether he just goes even further down, uh, which may be someone else's point um, <laughs> for, for this episode. Do you want to take that as your point? Yeah, you go. Go over it. Okay, I will. I will take this as my next point. And, and it's wound up really with the 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 Wilson Fisk and Matt uh, Murdoch uh, confrontation in the prison. Um, anything Wilson Fisk for me is, quite frankly, out the ballpark. Um, I've just absolutely loved... Uh, Vincent D'Onofrio from season one and here I just love his range of expressions that he conjures up I love his his twitching hands that he has as Wilson Fisk and mm. um, it, it it just conveys so much of his like that you know he, he's a boiling kettle that's he can't let off steam yeah and that's that's the only outlet is his hand moving and and then when it gets too much, he has the blowout, which is his rage, his fearsome rage. But before I go to the uh, Smith and Jones um, sketch, but <laughs> um, you know the great thing here, and I think um, I mentioned it before, it's the Ed Brubaker uh, comic series where Fisk is in prison, um, and so is Daredevil. Ultimately, that Fisk has absolutely destroyed. Um, the identity of who Daredevil is and all his relationships and his connections. And we see here, I think it's straight out of the comics, um, where he sat eating in his cell, almost it, it's fine dining a la, um, sort of a la Fisk. Yeah. A la, a la, um, sort of airplane ready meal kind mm-hmm. of thing, but he, he's eating it as though it is, you know, a, a burgundy red wine mm. and he's eating it off fine china. But, you know, is this the moment where Fisk, um, it becomes suspicious that Matt is connected to the Daredevil? He has that moment where he, he, he touches his lip and he's obviously reliving that punch that Matt gave to him, uh, over the table where he says, you know, a son of a, a boxer. And, um, you know, is that the moment where he remembers a similar punch when he met Daredevil and he asks for the file on Matt Murdock? Very good. Is yeah. it just to destroy Matt Murdock? Or is it that he's suddenly become suspicious that Matt may not be all that he seems? Um, and I mean, if it is just Matt Murdock, there's certainly which it could be, and um, given then that um, fight argument and um, just that confrontation across the, the table, which I just thought was fantastic. I just, to me, it was everything I would expect Wilson Fist to do. Um, you know, he's been blackmailed by Matt, um, and I just loved his retort that, I would spend more than six dollars to crush and destroy you and Foggy. I love the fact that, you know, he says, I'll cut the head off that two headed snake, you and Franklin Percy Nelson. I, he's just so exacting. And I just think, you know, he's doing all this beat down on Matt then when it gets physical and you've got his lawyer outside, you know, you've got the, pl- uh, the pr- prison guards outside, um, you know, and he just goes, they will deny it. And the inmates, they'll cut oh, out their tongues. So it's good. just such a power position. Um, and at the end where he says, let's do this again sometime, <laughs> you know, just, I just absolutely thought, um, fantastic. He really wants to just dismantle Matt Murdock and Foggy Nelson. And you can see it happening and he will destroy it. And I, I can't wait to see. And I hope that that is something that happens. Will it be in a season three? Mm. Will it be something surrounding Defenders or the Iron Fist storyline? I mean, this is one of the things now, because there are so many different um, seasons starting to take place with Jessica Jones season two. It's how these all intermesh. You know, we've got Luke Cage coming this September. Iron Fist is... Filming. being filmed at the moment yep. and and they're saying or well, i've read uh you know the, the defenders um that that will start sort of being filmed um back to back with with iron fist so it's like how will all these intermesh and if you have a storyline where um matt murdoch or daredevil well 
if you have a storyline where Matt Murdock is destroyed and his relationships and Daredevil is unmasked, how does that work into the Defenders? How does, you know, or is it just a season three um, thing or does it integrate into Iron Fist? There's so many different possibilities. Yeah. And how that all connects together. Or the new Punisher forward, series, maybe. Yeah. Will be really yeah. interesting, I reckon. Yeah. So I'll go back to the Kingpin bit in a second. Mm-hmm. But the, the actual timelines, I know we're going a bit off topic on this one. That's all right. But, it's our podcast. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this timeline. So I actually heard that they're filming Defenders back to back to Jessica Jones season two. That's right. Or maybe it was Jessica. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. So maybe it was Jessica Jones season two. They've then. wrapped and they're on pre uh, post production on Luke Cage. They're filming Iron Fist right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the end of this year, I think it's October, November, they'll start filming Jessica Jones, then straight into um, the Defenders. So yeah. that basically means Punisher and that the, un, unless they, they they start with different different teams, the Punisher and Daredevil season three will all have to have. Well, obviously we don't know if we're getting season three because this was never the plan. But then that's all we're tar- they're filming. Let's say January February. So Potentially, yeah, we'll probably that their the October session. They're the October piece probably for end of next year. Yeah. But I'm just, I'm just, I'm like in my head, I'm going, because I do, I going back then into uh, the Iron Fisk, uh, Iron Fisk, going back into Fisk. Um, like the, the Iron Fisk. The Iron Fisk. <laughs> or Wilson Fist. Oh. Yeah. Mash up. <laughs> um, I've been looking, I, I, that scene for me was just absolutely fantastic. And him yeah, rule, slowly ruling the... Um, slowly ruling the prison was mm-hmm. a great part of the last episode and how he kind of got around it but the the bit I'm seeing is that they, they are going towards this born again kind of like the born again arc from the comics where he's slowly putting together like because I when he t- put his fingers to his lips and touched the cut and then went called for Matt Murdock's yeah. I'm like yep He's just starting to make the connections. Yeah. yeah and then, like, he's already threatened the Murdoch and uh, Nelson. So now this is the extra. This is the straw that broke the camel's back or the the watermelon that was in the car door. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, or it's the icing on the cake yeah. for, for Wilson Fist. Absolutely. Or the cherry on top. I think he, I think he'd eat the whole cake. <laughs> and they definitely, yeah. definitely do that. Uh, we're not the only ones that thought that. Uh, David Wang over on our Facebook group says, okay, now that we're in spoiler territory, does anyone think this means that next season we might get an adaptation of that arc where Kingpin utterly messes up Matt's life, but then instantly regrets not killing Daredevil because the latter now has nothing left to lose? Uh, Ronaldo replied saying, yep, yeah, that's the Born Again, Born Again arc. Uh, I can see them doing that. I'd like to see Bullseye, though. Or even a proper version of the owl in season three. Um, loads of options for season three, and yeah, I'm, I'm totally with you guys. It does feel like this particular scene mm. is setting up uh, Wilson's future attack on Matt. Uh, but I don't. I do like the fact. One of the things I did like about that particular scene is that it does call out. He's not only after Matt. Uh, if we do see a born again translation in this, he's also after Foggy here. Uh, he specifically calls out that he knows the middle name of Foggy. So uh, Franklin, obviously. He call, he calls him Franklin Percival Nelson. So he is effectively that's showing his hand, showing that he's already investigated yeah. these two guys, um, and, which I really liked. And he knows that um, Matt's dad was a boxer. Mm-hmm. So there's all that. And actually, can I just quickly come in with one of my other points, just because? Um, You're never getting a point. Sorry, Chris. sorry. I know, <laughs> no, no, I know. No, I'm, I'm no, hogging no, no, everything. No, no, it, Welcome obviously. back, Chris. <laughs> but it's it's um it no it, it's to follow up on what Ronaldo says about Bullseye for me because we kind of caught a glimpse of um the calling card of Bullseye um in in season one. But is this shooter um that presumably is being hired by the blacksmith, a contract killer? Is it possibly Bullseye? Um, I was hoping, just thinking, please let it be bullseye. Please let it be bullseye. I am. Um, this would be fantastic. John, I both love you and hate you so much right now. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Because this feeds perfectly into one of my points <laughs> all about the Punisher. The, the ending of that point was, so we've, uh, 
We don't know who the shooter is. We never see. Could the shooter be the same shooter from the first one? Um, yeah, I, I complete. I think that they they've shown their hand slightly. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll start from the top of my point. So, this was the this was one of the the um, the the cracks in this episode that I found. Okay. Uh, um, in that the fact that we weren't seeing Castle kill these people like mm-hmm. Reyes and the medical examiner. Both gunned down, both yep. like very dramatically gunned down. Yeah. But that's not the character that we've met so far Absolutely. of Frank Castle. Like and the fact that they were always off screen mm-hmm. um and we know from the premiere that he's face to face or unless even even when sorry, not face to face, but when he's doing the even the Irish mob, mm-hmm. it's a lot more precision. Absolutely, and, it's up close and personal, yeah. which is exactly the way he wants to kill people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and for me, that was like that. Ju- this screamed fake out for me. Like and oh, that absolutely. was that was the thing, and I think that was like I, I, but I don't think they were trying to scream it as a fake out. Well, Karen did work it out pretty quickly that that this can't be Punisher's mo. I think you were mentioning it in your in your synopsis as well. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure whether the audience is supposed to be faked out, but everybody else has to assume in this city that if people are going if people are getting slaughtered and are they connect they're connected to the Punisher case, everybody else just assumes automatically it's Frank Castle. Yeah, and I think that that's what kind of annoyed me because it's I think it was the audience was supposed to think it wasn't Cas it was Castle. Yeah, and but I. I have to disagree with you both here. I mean, I get what you're saying, definitely. And obviously now with hindsight. But to me, going after Reyes and Blake Tower, um, for me, was absolutely Castle's MO. Because he'd learned in prison that it was law enforcement, that it was a sting, that they were involved, that the uh, medical examiner had dodgy... um, details and had faked aspects of it to to cover up um this this slaughter and this massacre so for frank's code and um, they are as much responsible as the dogs of hell um the hell's irish and also then the cartel that were involved there like so i could see that and then in the same way that the opening killing of the um, the Irish Americans in the bar scene, mm-hmm. that was um, yes, it was more precise, but it was still sp- we didn't see him in that scene. Um, it was a, a long range sniper machine gun being used, which sprayed the the bar, um, and because I think Matt obviously manages to kick uh, Foggy and um, Karen out the way uh, because Blake Tower is essentially hidden from the window. Um, then he's spraying the room to try and make sure he gets as many people as possible. Um, but obviously he's got to get out of there immediately because it's all the media coverage. So I kind of, I did feel it could be him. The fact that I didn't see him, I didn't suspect that it wasn't him. Can I come back on one tiny point on that? Yeah. Uh, Frank has specifically said that he will only kill uh, who he wants to kill because he's a one-shot killer. Um, he'll never spray a room full of bullets to try and take people out. But it's in, it is interesting. Well, that, that makes no sense for the first kill. He killed everybody in that room. The guy behind the bar. They, he thought he was dead behind the bar, but then he went off to finish him off. That was... Um, Grotto. Grotto. Yeah. Grotto. Yeah, but he thought Grotto was dead, and then it turned out Grotto wasn't dead, so he went and finished the kill. Yes, but he wouldn't spare a room full of bullets. Yeah, the point so that, that he was makes the thing. Karen. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to mm. watch back on that first uh-huh. one because, yes, he hits his mark, absolutely, but there's still the bullets all in. I mean, but, he, but I suppose the point is he wouldn't want to kill Matt, Karen, and Foggy. Who he considers um, innocent. But to the point... To, and remember, he misses Grotto on a number of occasions as well. Yeah. As, yeah. as that him and Karen are escaping from the so hospital. To, to this point, he's not bullseye. 
that that's kind of it, it's I know he says he will take the shot. He'll he he knows how to shoot someone with one bullet is what he is the point he makes to Karen. Um but he's not bullseye, he's not a perfect shot. Uh, I think that the one of the elements that jumped out to me in the episode, and as we're talking about it here, could this other shooter be bullseye? Um one of the elements that's made very clear by Claire Temple is that the bullet that went through Foggy went through cleanly and perfectly, uh, leaving no damage behind. He's gonna be released from from hospital in a day. So I do wonder if if that is bullseye that took the shot and was taking out Foggy and the other people in the room, uh, taking them out of, um, not of harm's way, but taking them out of being a problem yeah. uh, for them in the future. Do you know what I mean? So is this bullseye and his MO was to kill Reyes, shoot her three times, uh, p- patter the room with bullets so that nobody else jumps back up and gets injured and knock Foggy down to take everybody else out of the room. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe for the medical examiner, it is less his MO, absolutely, because there it seems that he's broken down the door, I think, mm-hmm. and yeah. then Pepper. rather than a headshot, um, presumably with a guy who, you know, is going to be on his knees cowering, he's going to be frightened and scared, it's not like he's going to put up much of a fight, and if he does, it's going to be a desperate thing, so yeah. it's going to be... Probably, yeah, that one shot. That I understand. Mm-hmm. But I think from the initial um uh, office scene and that uh, gunfight, or oh, sorry, not gunfight, but from that sort of um firestorm of bullets, that made sense that that could be Frank Castle to me, given the Irish mobster uh, bar scene at the start where you didn't see him. He sprays that room with bullets in order to kill all those people. Again, there's multiple targets in here, all running for cover. Therefore, he's got to throw a few bullets around to try and get them. Anyway, I'm hoping it's Bullseye. Yo, and I agree with you. And in this world, I don't think Bullseye has to be a perfect shot either. Like, in terms of the reality of it. It could be that he, you know, like Frank Castle, either he is deliberately spraying the room in that way in order to try and replicate what Frank may do, or, um, you know, he's not as perfect as the comic books because in this world, maybe it is a bit more, uh, real life street level. So therefore he can miss, you know, like Frank Castle can as well. So maybe it's that, but I just hope that it is. So uh, bullseye, basically. So I do think I think it is bullseye. I think, but like yeah, much I like do. season one of Daredevil, where we saw the origin of Daredevil, we're also in between now seeing what we we don't know it, but from like we had season one con- episode condemned, where we saw a guy he was training, he he shot, and we think we all went that's bullseye, amazing, and now we're seeing this the second one, where he's now doing his second kill in the second series. He was aiming for Reyes and uh, Foggy and Matt and Karen, making it look like Punisher. So we're seeing his growth as... A, um, so because the only reason that Matt and uh, Karen survived is because Matt threw her down. And if Matt hadn't have pushed Foggy at the same time, that would have gone through Foggy's chest. Interesting. So I think what we are seeing is uh, Bullseye's origin, but we're not being told it. And I think he is a hired killer. Fisk is out there. Definitely. And Fisk has said, go take out these two people, make it look like Punisher, get them after him. Um, because Punishers are going to do what he needs to do as well. It just, I think it's possibly because we overanalyze some of these episodes. Never. No. <laughs> On an hour long podcast? Of course not. Hey. <laughs> well, could, do you think it could be the blacksmith as well? Absolutely. It, it could also be that the blacksmith's code name is is Bullseye or something like that. I, I totally I see where you're going with that. We've only got three episodes left in this season, and I can't see a way out of the season without knowing who's taking these shots. At least for Frank, at least set him on the path of of who it is that he's going after, who's trying to make it look like Frank Castle. So, uh, how do we now tie up Frank Castle's arc without him going after uh, this person? Yeah. So maybe Bullseye is either a pseudonym for um, the blacksmith or blacksmiths hired him as the contract killer to take out Reyes to really, again, just put the heat onto uh, the Punisher mm-hmm. or whether even it could be the blacksmith himself yeah, or maybe. herself um, or itself. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Chris, do you want to give us your next point? Yes, I'm going to talk about Karen and the bulletin. Yes, interesting. Yeah. So, um, 
This sounds really positive, Chris. It does, does no. <laughs> I'm sorry, people. This this is another one that just isn't making a whole lot of sense for me, and it's just it, it I, again in this episode it just came to a head. Deborah Ann Wall has been brilliant in this season. I have to mm-hmm. admit it. Like she is an actress is fantastic. Sorry, I should clarify that. And in season one, I don't think it was the it was Deborah. I think it was the way that they wrote Karen that was so annoying to some of for all of us because we all Not had all something. Of us. All of us had one or but two bad things to say across the whole series. Okay, just me then. Uh, sorry, I'm getting. Oh no, I did. Yeah, no, okay. absolutely. I so it was just that. myself and John who didn't like the the writing. Irene had some problems with it. Yeah. Her little crusade to uncover the truth about Frank is really starting to... Okay, let's say irk me. How does that say? That? Irk. Uh, not because I don't think Karen is the kind of strong, confident... Uh, most, uh, like, a strong, confident character. A smart enough character to handle anything like that. Because um, they just shoehorned her into the bulletin. If you know what I mean. Okay, it's very much like, I, I think, well, okay, this is where my head is going with this, because it doesn't make sense that a, a newspaper editor would go, oh, well, you found one or two cool things. Well, here's an office. Like, why don't you go and sit in there and you can work for Well, here's us. a dead guy's office. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's very much a kind of circle with a square peg kind okay. of thing. It's um, It's like the writers realized... Kind of when they started this, because remember, it was always supposed to be one series, so, like one one season. That was it. It's like they kind of went, "Oh God, we killed off Ben Ulrich. We I need am, a reporter." I am hundred percent. I am a hundred percent certain that that's exactly what happened. Yeah. Um, I do like Karen in this in this role. I think it's a really good role for Karen to have. We've complained in the past, or some of us have complained in the past about Karen getting too involved in the law side when she doesn't have a law degree. Uh, I think this is perfect for her. She's she's the kind of investigated, tenacious character uh, that you should find in a newsroom. And if you have killed off your proper reporter character from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, why not give it to Karen? She is a. Uh, I believe she has some kind of past in in the comic books as some form of writer uh, in some of the earlier uh, some some of the earlier Daredevil stories so why not give her the the job in a in a in a newsroom it keeps her involved in the storylines definitely and i can see it for her character being the kind of pushy aggressive person that wants to get this information out to people it's better for her to do it th- this way than trying to get involved in criminal cases without a, a law degree for me and i agree with you like it does make sense for her to be there it well i wish it was ben i that's the thing i think like but it was such a, an abrupt change like literally it was oh you're doing some oh you've got some information oh you've got some evidence okay now you're a reporter here's a press pass bam like within two episodes <laughs> well okay you say three to be fair it's just very much it was like she shoehorned in um to be that ben Ulrich character mm. um and i don't know she isn't she isn't investigating anything other than frank castle right now right now Right so she's now. not just a reporter. She is just investigating this. But she's been given story, an right? office, and she has a press pass. Mm-hmm. So they've given her a press pass. So it's it was just for me. And we know ourselves that never happens. Exactly. Lightly. No. 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 Exactly. No. It takes a lot of work to get one of those. Anyway, I, I just just to wrap this kind of point up. It's like Deborah Ann Wall, uh, fantastic, brilliant actress. Loved mm-hmm. her in this series. Karen, Karen as a character. Is great. The the uh, the expo- the the exploration they're doing with her character is fantastic. Like the what's in the file, Karen? What's in the file? Uh, that that was like, oh, brilliant! Yay! I think they know where they're going with it. I I mm-hmm. I like to see the this variation on it. It's just the crusade element that they put her on, and they're trying to. She's no Ben. She is a bit crusadey. I definitely. I definitely get that. But I think um, I'm much more on the side of that. I think the newspaper role, the researcher and investigator for for print is better than the law thing, even though you can have the researcher there. But I think because she was so entwined with Matt uh, and Foggy um, and, and, and being almost one of the partners, but despite having a law degree, I like this idea of her being embroiled in the newspaper. I think the Ulrich thing has a kind of a personal aspect or slant to Karen's story. Mm. 
So I don't mind her so much, but I know what you mean. I think she's tenacious, and I think that is really now how I see her character. Mm-hmm. I think it wasn't articulated well in season one, that aspect. And, and maybe as well, that was part of my own problem with thinking that she was going to be absolutely drug riddled and that was going to be her main, uh, sort of story arc. Certainly given the whole Madame Gao and the cocaine movement, um, through the Yakuza and, and all that kind of, um, story arc. I thought there was really going to be that. And the fact that that didn't happen, um, kind of to me left Karen in limbo a bit um for me as a character and I think the writers did that anyway in season one a bit and um, here I think this season much better and I do like her being put into uh, the newspaper and um, it, it's strange when we talk about how real and gritty is it's strange that when we talk about these series as being, you know, more realistic, more street level, that some of the things that are most fantastical are the fact that she is, um, can just walk into a major newspaper publication and, and get an office. Okay. I suppose she's got a good story to tell. And so any good editor would go for it. But nonetheless, um, I suppose it's just how quickly, uh, it takes effect here it's saying it, that seems to be the, unbelievable aspect of it okay. but um i kind of but what i mean is i think that's just the storytelling because they have to get through it quickly so um i'm not that doesn't bother me so much i mean i actually really liked her interaction with the editor in this Definitely. um i i like the fact that we're starting to see a bit more you know about um him saying uh you know you projected here um you know you're projecting your own thoughts here and that you have to look um and be open to the truth and you can't blind yourself or close you off to uh, the evidence that, you know, you're rooting for Frank here uh, rather than looking at the evidence when she comes to him about, you know, well, it's not his MO. She yeah. needs to get evidence. Um, and, you know, she's starting to accept that herself, that she needs to be more evidence-based. Um, she says, I won't accept my gut this time. I need to have the evidence. Um and, uh, you know, I really like that. I think it explores Karen's character much better, those moments. And I think this season has done that really well. So I, I don't mind the, the newspaper angle at all. Mm-hmm. I think it fits her character better, if I'm honest, for me. But I can see why, um, Chris, I, I can see why you yeah. would say that, yeah. definitely. No, no, no. And like, I hadn't thought about it like that. So that's a fair point. And it actually makes a bit more sense to me. But it's, it, it's just. It still feels, just to kind of close the point, it still feels to me that they kind of, again, they didn't think they would be killing Ben Ulrich mm-hmm. and they wouldn't need a season two character like that. I and agree, definitely. Then they're like, okay, well, actually, but then looking at the character as a whole, it does, you're right. So the, the second element is, yeah, she does fit that person who should be there. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting. I, I, and I have to say, I did like that little interaction with the um, with. The editor of, of the bulletin where he says, where she says to him, um, when he tries to get the cops to take her home, she goes, you never used to treat Ben Ulrich with this kind of crap. You always used to let him do what he wanted to do. And he says, I'll never make that mistake no, again. Yes. So okay, I yeah. thought that was a really yeah, good, really yeah. good, yeah. Absolutely. really good moment. So again, it's not only has she just walked into a newspaper. She also knows the guy. He, he feels responsible for the death of Ben because he didn't take the right precautions. He allowed Ben to go on his investigation, pushed along by Karen, admittedly. Um, but he, there is some involvement there and there is some history and I really like in having these other side characters explored a little bit more as well. So Derek, what's your next point? My next point is the other element of the Rea's attack uh, where she effectively bursts all of our conspiracy bubbles in, uh, yeah. in one scene. <laughs> yeah. What a moment. Sorry listeners hope you enjoyed our, uh, our a ideas wild speculation. of what might be coming up and I hope again anybody who's seen the rest of the season is enjoying our speculation of what might happen. Uh, but this moment left me a little bit crestfallen uh, as we had Reyes explain that actually no, there was no men in suits, there was no involvement from uh, any of the characters yeah. in, in Jessica Jones, no shield She's no, not scroll. No aim. She's not a scroll. Or no, the hand. Was just, yeah, she doesn't have a... Cree blood coursing through no. her veins like we all speculated. Nothing. I think that was actually some speculation at some point. Uh, she's not she Hulk. No, nothing at all. She simply is. Uh, all of Frank's family were caught in the crossfire. Simple undercover operation led by her office. And uh, yeah, she just tried to kill Frank to cover it all up. That's it. That's the only story here. Uh, 
Will we find out at all who the men in uh, suits were that were constantly surveilling Frank's place? The people that took out uh, the orderly from that was in uh, the nurse, I guess, who was in uh, the hospital with Frank. Um, I guess it doesn't really matter. They just seem to work for Reyes and she's now dead. Is that the end of the story? Are, 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 are all of our theories about who could possibly be connected to this, were they all wrong? As Foggy said, this case just keeps on giving up shit burgers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, quite frankly... Um, you know, Reyes, you made a mistake. You covered it up. Um, pretty badly. Yeah. But... Pre- to be fair, pretty badly for the district attorney. Is it karma? Uh, okay, yeah, I suppose. Uh, no. Maybe. <laughs> um, but she's not pro-registration or no. anti-vigilante. She really was just trying to protect her own ass. Yeah, yeah basically. Basically, yeah. yeah. What a pity. Yeah. And it's interesting, I kind of found that Blake Tower's response as well, it's almost like once she was dead, he could come clean, but I wonder how truthful that is, and will we see him again? I mean, he he, he talks about getting out of town, you know, he still wants to stay alive, he's, you know, he's frightened for his life, but will we see him again? Um, it would be quite interesting. Is he being as honest as um, he kind of seems... Uh, to be suggesting he is um, mm-hmm. outside of the the DA's office. So um, I'm wondering if you've still got more to come from Blake Tower or is that his kind of story over? He is going to go upstate New York um, or he's going to go to, I don't know, deep into the Brazilian rainforest in order to try and escape a potential headshot from who he thinks the Punisher is coming after him. Yeah, like it is, um, it is interesting that he does explain away Reyes' motives very quickly. Um, that is, his his opinion is that she probably did the right thing um, in a way. Uh, Frank's, Frank didn't have a family. Nobody was going to miss him. Um, maybe at that point she, th- she made the right decision and he might have made the same one. I'm kind of expecting since we did see Reyes up in, uh, in Jessica Jones, uh, that we may see Black Terror up in, uh, in Luke Cage. Just another bit of connective tissue in the city. I'm hoping, uh, I might see him in, in the future. I hope so. I mean, as we've said anyway on a previous podcast, he does run for DA actually. Mm-hmm. So maybe now that Foggy, um, is obviously in the wind as well. There's both these lawyers in the wind that maybe they, they go head to head, um, for the DA battle royale. Perhaps. I'm sorry. I love the name of that song. Lawyers in the wind. Lawyers in the wind. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on that, John, do you want to give us your next point? My next point's the, um, reference to the, the cheap, um, science fiction novel. Mm-hmm. But, um, I loved, the reference to science fiction. I love the fact that the um, midwitch cuckoos um, came alive here, <laughs> children of the corn, mm-hmm. whatever it is. I think when you have freaky children, creepy children um, with, you know, strange looking eyes, there is nothing better in science fiction, horror and um, horror in general. Uh, and this was just a call out for it. Um, you know, there's no um, mistaking the reference there as they all lift their heads at the same time in unison that they all turn around, you know, um, the poor, um, the poor accountant th- thinks he's got his, um, his son back. And then what we actually find is that he's being used as a bit of a drug cocktail. So that all these toxins, what we hear from Claire Temple, um, is that from the tox report, you've got, um, a load of substances being pumped into these kids almost as an incubation um as well as the blood being taken out you know um basically these are meat bags being used for some kind of incubation but it's being interrupted so are these the the men in the box you know in terms of the reference to the t- to the title of this episode um probably not but i loved this for me this was total midwich cuckoos i'm a big john Wyndon fan anyway mm-hmm. so and um, this i just loved for that you know the dad gets his comeuppance you know of course dan yeah sorry daddy i've just killed yeah. you uh. um you know i think what does he say you know it's really not gonna get better from here on in for the poor accountant um but yeah i loved it you know claire temple running in seeing his body snotted on the floor mm-hmm. blood everywhere and like Oh, just yeah. as, the, as the lights flicker, yeah. just exactly Perfect. like something out of out of a good '70s sci-fi film. I just really got enjoyed. so giddy with excitement with this because I just think, like, what are they going to do next? And like, so then it asks and prompts the question: Are the hand coming to rescue them? 
because they're a prize worth keeping, or do they have to put them down because something has been let out prematurely uh, and it needs to be, um, you know, reset, started again? You know, are they here to kill or to to capture? Very uh, the, yeah. These children really like it, and if they are, you know, are these kids going to do some massive smackdown of like massive scary proportions? Probably not, actually. You never, you never know. They took out, the, took out the accountant pretty easily. Well, no, they <laughs> just cut his really neck. Like, <laughs> yeah. They could have, like, given him wrong algebra to do, and it would have freaked him out. <laughs> Absolutely. Put his head into, like, a complete tiz was. I think it's Black Sky. It must be. They they are incubant, incubating, like, for Black Sky. That's what's in the, va- the vat. Um, that's the only thing that makes a lot of logical mm-hmm. yeah, sense. absolutely. Because remember, they may the first black sky yeah, was taken. They're the weapons, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so the little boy in the mm-hmm. container was taken yep. by stick. I remember so it well because we, we always know... thought it was a connection to uh, the Inhuman Sky on the uh, on yeah. Agents of Shield. So I, could, I couldn't. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was another. Oh my one god, we, got we have so on. many. Really, some of our theories are great, and they do pan out. And some of them are just my god, people just shut us <laughs> up at some point. But there's also the immortal um, weapons from Iron Fist as well. True. True. There Lots. was that oh, yeah. speculation, yeah. and we still don't know on that. But just because it didn't come true yet <laughs> doesn't mean it may not. Exactly. Yeah. So you never know. We never know what we might see as we get closer to uh, to Doctor Strange and Iron Fist. Chris, do you want to give us your final <laughs> point? I do, and I'm going to end on a bad oh, note again. No. I'm sorry, um, Electra. So good note. We know where she gets her side. Yeah. Yay! Good note. It was a f- the fight was it pretty was awesome. good. Bad news. Why did we? They cut away for fifteen minutes. Like we just literally cut. Okay, we're gonna fight, and then cut away. Different scenes, different scenes, different scenes, and then it's like, wham, bam, mm-hmm. you're back. And then there's something mid fight. Like I wanted to see that fight there, and then that would have been a better okay. flow, better end. Well, that's alright. That's alright. That's like, not too much of a complaint, was, I suppose. That's not too bad. No, like, and we saw where she got her mm-hmm. side, and, that's, and stick exactly center. that big reveal. Like holy yeah. schwa! Uh, I like. I have some theories percolating in my brain, but I need to give it one more episode before I kind of get. I uh, go on. Do wild speculation again that doesn't come true. <laughs> okay. Okay, I think Electra's more than Electra in this episode, in this series. Is that a song? More than Electra. <laughs> um, I think she was stolen from the hand. Uh, by interesting, Stick. interesting. Cool, that would be very cool. A Stick has kept her mm-hmm. since a child, and he's been training her since a child, and... We know she's Greek, and but that's kind of all cover. And then all of a sudden, when she no longer does what Stick says, he killed once her dead. Yeah, very interesting. I yeah. think I can roll with that for the time being. The whole th- yeah, the whole thing is like to, you know the bit she said like, I can't control the, fe- the 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 want of death. I think it was. I'm paraphrasing uh-huh. obviously, but um, I think I don't know. I think she's she's something like. Demony, maybe? No, not demony, but she's something. Well, there's definitely the connection of Electra with the hand anyway. And so, yeah, exactly. Like, this angle could very well be true. And it, I'm, I'm up for that. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I think like there's more to her than just being Electra being like uh, a kick ass mm-hmm. cool assassin. I just, they, they could do it that way. I just think. They're starting to hint. They've definitely more. been playing up the bad side of Electra since the start. She's not just another version of of uh, of Matt who happened to go along with Stick's teachings. Uh, she's definitely yeah. a bad girl. Um, who I think more than Matt Stick was probably reining her in rather than trying to teach her a path. Uh, it seems like she yeah. always was the assassin, and he just helped her hone her skills rather than him training her to be an assassin which is uh, which has been coming out a lot more over the last few episodes yeah good interesting interesting idea but i have to say i love the opening when it does come back uh, to that fight sequence uh, i love the start of the fight sequence which is effectively a champagne glass flying across the room uh, directly into electra's foot as she smashes it midair very cool scene <laughs> yeah. really oh cool. no it was a brilliant scene i just wish that they, they hadn't have broken the flow because I literally came straight into 
a fight and I had to kind of remember it's like oh okay yeah, no, I was really excited yeah. for this fight and it was just like oh okay wait hold on it was just I think it was just I don't know why they edited mm-hmm. it in that way overall I think this whole episode was a series of really long scenes cut and edited okay. in different ways like it's like we have a 20 minute scene with Matt, Matt and Claire on a roof in a hospital okay so we're gonna cut this part here and then put it here and then we'll put this part here and then oh we have lectures fighting which is 10 minutes okay we'll take 5 minutes of that <laughs> and put it here I don't know what it is about the, it was just this really too disjointed for you yeah. yes Okay. That's Even though what you've described okay. is basically editing, that's kind. That's kind of what I do every week for the podcast, Chris. <laughs> okay, so you take this uh-huh. part and you put it, here. and I make my okay. try and make myself sound coherent as well. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's there's no hope there. I did kind of feel that the whole Electra thing was um, didn't need to be in this episode in some respects, um, or it could have been done as a single kind of little scene at some point. Because Absolutely. to begin with, and maybe this is why I think that, I think because it was kind of the follow-on scene after Matt and Wilson Fisk had been fighting it out and confronting one another in the prison, and obviously Vanessa had been brought up, because of the glamorous car, the private jet, and all that, and because the face was hidden... I thought this was Vanessa oh, yeah. coming back. Yeah. And I don't I didn't understand necessarily why she had the scarf over her head and was hiding her face. I mean it doesn't matter, but because it was hidden immediately after that, I thought this was Vanessa returning to to New York City. So and then all of a sudden it was Electra and it yeah. kind of took me out of, of 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 the scene a bit because I somehow wasn't expecting Electra to be in that scene. I thought it was Vanessa. Yeah. And then it kind of stopped, as you say. I mean, okay, you were wondering, well, who is Jack? Um, uh, you know, what's he doing? He only bought actually a three quarter bottle of tequila and I suppose tequila watch. Don't know what the brand is. <laughs> I thought it was Uzo. Greek. I thought he said tequila, but, uh, yeah. Someone who has subtitles, let us know. It, it wasn't until much later on that this fight's going on. So it did seem a bit weird in that sense. Um, I can, I can, I can understand that. But I think for me, it was more because I thought this was Vanessa returning to New York City, given the yeah, scene previous yeah, to it. And, and when it was suddenly Electra kind of all sort of hiding her face and so on, I was oh, okay. Um, and then the scene was kind of almost over before I'd really gotten into it. And then it kind of carried on afterwards with the fight. But, um, yeah, it, it was good to see the, the fight. I mean, I loved it when she picked up the corkscrew because I was thinking, oh, oh, that's such a nasty weapon anyway. Oh, um, yeah, but I don't think cool. she hit her mark with the corkscrew. Yep. I think it was only just with the two the, sides. Yeah, the two <laughs> sides. The chest. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Very, very cool, definitely. So just before we kind of close up that one, so you remember we were talking about that this was all of the, this was the cast, and they, there was many different members, and we've seen Stick, we've seen mm-hmm. Stone. Who do we think this was? Jack. Similar to similar to the guy, like we know Jack, but they all they, there's like there's Shaft, Claw, Flame, Star, Wing. These are the members, and we don't know who the driver was. So are these just the underlings? He didn't seem like an underling. So I'm going. Could this be Claw or the 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 ex person of Claw, who used to, rather than having handheld metal blades. Used so, interesting, inside? yeah, Maybe. possibly, yeah. possibly. Again, just going off on a random. <laughs> no, manager. but that's yeah, that that would be really interesting to have have those uh, characters here. Um, but yeah, I mean, so far it's a shack. Yeah, and for my final point, uh, the one I want to talk about is oh no, we've talked about the the uh, Fisk versus Murdoch moment, but I really like it from Murdoch's side as well. Um, we've talked about Fisk being threatening. I think Matt's really threatening in the scene as well. The, the scene itself probably takes place in kind of, um, in three main sequences effectively, a real good three act play. If it's, it shows Matt waiting to go into, to Wilson Fisk, you see his nervousness going in, which was something that I wasn't really expecting from Matt. Um, he looks really nervous going into, uh, into the prison. You hear the heartbeat as he walks up. Uh, the, the corridor going to, going to Fisk. And then his, then the next kind of act of it is his threat to Fisk. The fact that he's effectively saying to him with, um, with a quick letter to the right person, I can make sure that Vanessa never arrives back in this country again. 
Uh, oh, I loved yeah. the, the again, Matt pulling it back to the two of them being New Yorkers, effectively saying she'll never come back and you'll never leave this city because just like me, New York is in your blood and you can't go anywhere else out of New York without wanting to come back. Um, really, really enjoyed this kind of moment between the two of them, uh, led by uh, led by Matt, where he's kind of, uh, again, bringing Fisk to his level, bringing the two of them as on that level playing field that they ended season one on. I uh, just thought it was a really nice touch. I mean, the thing I loved, though, is I loved the abject terror when he realizes that his blackmail hasn't worked. Mm. His, his hard play, his, his kind of, his, his, you know, maybe his, what he thinks has been his winning throw of the, the dice. It's not worked. All of a sudden, it's been totally turned back on him. Yeah. And I love the panic, mm. the fear uh, in the man with no fear. Mm. Really cool. Like, I thought that was superb. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, really liked it, though. I think that's it for all of the overall points on the episode. A uh, couple of notes. Yeah, I've got a couple. I really liked when um, it's Detective or Sergeant Mahoney uh, arrives at the, the place where the kids are being drained. Mm-hmm. I love when he says to, to Daredevil, just know that someday I'm going to tell you how to do your job. I was like... Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Love that little clip yeah. back to, to Daredevil. Nice touch for Sergeant Really Mahoney. good uh, touch. And again, just coming back to uh, Matt Murdock and Wilson Fisk, I love the end of that scene where it, it, it replicates the rabbit in the snowstorm scene where it's the view. And, and this is obviously one of the, you know, the character traits um, that, it, that is used now to depict Wilson Fisk is his back to the camera looking and staring at a wall. Um, and here you have that, you know, the, the view of the prison wall. Okay. It's not white in this case, but again, it just, it's just a, it replicates that, you know, fr- from the, the fiery red to the, the, the white, the snow white, and now just to a regular wall. It's that, it's that image of Wilson Fisk, that hulking bulk of a, of a man sat almost slightly slouchy um just looking at a wall yeah um really good yeah yeah no really good stuff uh one note for me just really quickly because i confused the heck out of me the first time i watched the episode uh it's effectively where where claire temple is bringing in the kids into the hospital uh and says that they need something to cool them down and the nurses say to her they're all out of ice anybody find that strike strike them as slightly weird it did until I watched it a second time. Uh, the reason why why I, I, it was resolved in my head the second time is because I forgot that in the first two episodes of the series, they consistently mentioned they're in the biggest heat wave that New York has ever seen uh, at the moment. Oh, so this okay. is the first reference we've had to the heat wave in New York for six episodes. Uh, they stopped talking about the fans in the office. They stopped talking about how sweaty they all were when they were running around. Um, I think it's important to keep that in mind. We're, we're in Hell's Kitchen here. It's supposed to be the hottest time. Uh, I like that there's a reference in here, but I just didn't get it the first time around. I was wondering why, hang on a second, we're in a hospital and they don't have any ice. That's ridiculous. You know, they've got a, a huge, uh, a huge hospital. Uh, a huge building here with lots of patients that clearly need ice. So I just thought it was quite a little touch just put in the background there. But is the heat coming from the sun or is it coming from underneath? I'm wondering that. Is it yeah. supernatural? Is it Dormammu's flaming head that's just really <laughs> cooking the surface of Hell's Kitchen? That's entirely possible. Doctor Strange was a defender. Absolutely. All leading to Doctor Strange. Indeed. Oh, it's whatever that massive hunking hole is um, in, yeah. uh, Much in, more in the likely. apartment block. Much more likely. That's yeah. probably more likely. Let's just go with that. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I've got one other note as well. And that's obviously that Frank Castle isn't the shooter. We've kind of, I suppose, said that implicitly just with talking about it could be bullseye Uh but that he does save karen from being shot herself so there is this idea now that karen is a target or was it frank but it seems to me that maybe he was going after uh, karen page and in which case just thinking about it does that mean that he could have been hired by wilson fisk maybe Maybe. Or have we said that already? I, I think maybe Chris, you may have said that. But you know, if he wants to destroy um, Foggy and Matt's um, life, de- you know, deconstruct their and dismantle their lives, that Karen would figure in that as well. So the fact that uh, this person who is pretending to be Frank Castle is going after Karen Page is it ultimately in the end Wilson Fisk, or again, 
is it the blacksmith? Um, because the blacksmith may now be aware that his name is out there as a, as a lead to be followed up on. Just the fact there that Karen obviously uh, gets saved. And then I have one final other thing, which I really quite liked, where Matt's kind of lamenting the fact that um, everything gets undone. He's kind of questioning, you know, really what he's achieved as Daredevil. Um, but I do like that Claire comes back and goes, well, you know, I stitch up the same three crackheads each night. <laughs> so I understand what you're yeah, yeah. saying. I just thought it was a really kind of nice way of saying, don't talk to me about like not getting things achieved. Absolutely. I have to do the same uh, three crackheads that come in uh, each night because mm-hmm. they never learn or it never gets better. <laughs> there right. is this cyclic thing going on as well. So I just really like yeah, that line. I really enjoyed Matt's point because he's absolutely right. It's effectively um, a guy I saw burned to death has come back to life. Um, Frank Castle, who I know went to prison, is now back out in the streets and has killed the DA. And also, Wilson Fisk, who I sent to prison, is now running the prison. <laughs> like, nothing works out for me. Really, yeah, really enjoyed that. No. <laughs> uh, very cool. Uh, on that note, Chris, do you defend this episode of Daredevil? Season 2, Episode 10, The Man in the Box. I, I'm very much on the fence with this, so I neither defend nor so you defend this guilty. episode. Uh- I defense this episode. Yes, exactly. So while still containing some really great, compelling moments... Um, this, for me, was structurally probably the weakest chapter or episode to date mm-hmm. in the season. And that says something. Like, we, in season one, we had some up and down, and there were some big downs. It took them ten episodes to get to uh, one that I kind of found... Ugh. And I think it could be just the structuring or the editing, as we kind of just kind of alluded to in this episode. In my head, too much of... The episode was kind of hinging on this murder spree that, as an audience, now in my opinion, but John, you kind of disagree. It's like they, it couldn't have been committed mm-hmm. by Frank. And it was kind of obvious. obvious. Um, so I don't know. So great scene. I, I, I'm on defense about the episode. So I'm going to say three out of five if I was to do a kind of thing. I think it was the structuring. I think uh, and uh, like it had some other great moments. And aside from... Just this, the structuring and this, the way they kind of try to drag you along to make you think it mm-hmm. was Frank, while not making, while making it kind of too, almost too obvious that it wasn't. It could have been so easily fixed if they had shown a different shooter, and then you would go, oh, they're trying to set up Frank, oh my god, brilliant, uh, like, that would have been a bit more, mm, for me. So, I'm gonna go, overall, I'm on defense. So, John, do you defend this episode? I do defend uh, this episode of uh, Daredevil. Um, I'm actually starting to question myself whether I am just being too liberal with my praise, actually, because um, I really liked this episode. I thought it was really, really strong. Um, and I would definitely um, be giving this 4.5 creepy kids or midwitch cuckoos out <laughs> of uh, five. Um <laughs> I definitely get the points uh, with regards to Electra, and I suppose with the fact that the the shooting of Reyes, you know, that yeah, was that or wasn't that Frank? I, I think you could ha- ask that question. Um, for me, it wasn't that obvious that it wasn't Frank for that first shooting. So you know, I was kind of buying into that, to be honest. Um, yeah. So. That didn't spoil the episode for me, but I, I think primarily it, it comes from the strength of... Uh, I wasn't expecting Wilson Fisk uh, to be back in this episode, mm-hmm. and I loved this scene. For me, this is just really good. It's like a, a two-person stage play, as Derek kind of said. It is so strong, so powerful, uh, really great uh, acting, such a fantastic scene. Um, and we have Claire uh, Temple back, and she just adds a really great perspective and she adds a, a, a humor which doesn't detract from a lot of the serious stuff that she, she really has to say. Um, she is kind of like this, um, moral center for Matt who really has to kind of bring him back on track every time she sees him. And yeah. um, I really like the fact, as I said before, uh, in a previous episode that um, you know, Matt and Foggy's relationship just keeps on getting worse and worse. It's not, um, like, oh, next episode, it's getting better. It's getting worse. You know, at, 
at the time where his best friend is on a gurney uh, with uh, a bullet wound through the shoulder, you know, Matt still has that temerity to say, I'm not asking for permission. You know, maybe, you know, as Claire says, uh, you need to just go and see your friend. Um, you know, I love how they're really making Matt, I think, into a bit of an ass. Um, mm-hmm. and I'd love to see how that plays out. Um, and, I think to see Rays get shot uh, and that all come out, I thought was really interesting. And I loved the children of the corn here. I loved um, mm. that turn of them. You think they're getting better. You then hear that actually they've had a load of toxic stuff pumped into them. Um, and they turn out to be those crazy psychotic kids um, with creepy eyes. For me, that, I've watched Children of the Corn for the Urban Harvest. It is possibly the worst film ever. However, <laughs> I still watch it and I want to watch it over and over again because I love creepy kids um, with golden pupils or with blank pupils or whatever. Just that is such a great horror trope, quite frankly, that I love. Um, so that was just a nice thing for me. Mm-hmm. Um, probably most people are going, why is he getting so excited by this? But I just happen to really like uh, that kind of aspect of horror. And to me, this was a nice little horror segment in, in, in Daredevil. Absolutely. Um, and, it, and it helps with the whole yeah. mystical element of it as well. You know, we are starting to see and learn now about Black Sky and these weapons and, and all of this um, that the hand are trying to to resurrect so for me this is really sets up a nice intrigue going into the next episode so definitely defend um this episode um but i'm wondering whether i have to start peeling back the numbers um i'm wondering whether my <laughs> critical appraisal is being far too consumed by fanboy stuff like midwich cookies <laughs> <laughs> maybe but it, listeners if you want to find an episode uh, of a podcast that john particularly dislikes uh just to give some perspective on uh, that he isn't over fandom and go and go and listen to our fantastic four podcast you'll you'll hear what you'll hear when he really doesn't like <laughs> something um or gotham episode 16 over on gotham tv podcast go over and listen to that podcast you'll see what it's like when uh, when john feels a little let down by a show he likes uh luckily we haven't had any of those in the in uh, daredevil so far or any of the defender series so far that have gone uh to that level i suppose but derek do you defend this episode of daredevil uh, yeah as i said we haven't had an episode that's let us down yet uh definitely for me uh overall Every time I see Claire Temple uh, in an episode, especially with as much to do, she's a really active character in this episode. When I see her in these episodes where she's got lots to do and works with Matt, um, absolutely great. Always get, adds that little extra bit of flair uh, to the episodes. Having Fisk and Matt face off in this episode, excellent. We've got the kids. You've mentioned them a couple of times, John. But the opening scene as well, uh, when Mahoney finds them um, all crouched in the, in the dark, is another great horrific scene it doesn't yeah, connect definitely. exactly to last week's episode it doesn't connect to uh, the end of last episode where nobu left after the fight with uh, with uh, matt um it's it, the room is darkened the kids are looking even creepier even more emaciated it's almost like a couple more weeks have passed after that fight it's not it is immediately afterwards but it's a very different tone to how last uh, last episode ended so thought that was a really nice touch um and then the closing of the episode fantastic we have the attack of the hand as they climb up the buildings um of of the hospital awesome stuff really really cool so yes definitely defend this episode of daredevil I think with that, it's time to get into the feedback. Uh, we got a little bit of feedback about this episode in uh, by email over to feedback at DefendersTVPodcast.com from Ronaldo. He says, hi, guys. So much to love about this episode. Having Claire back is like a soothing balm, although she is always frantic on screen. Uh, the kids who were rescued from underground may be victims, but I just get a tense feeling that they have been affected in more ways than one from their ordeal. The scene with Reyes and the eventual exposition into the conspiracy at the central park carousel was well acted and written reyes shows her human side it was a nice touch having her in civvies too and the end of the scene is tragic and totally unexpected if not for the split second warning matt gets from his hypersenses 
The confrontation between Matt and Kingpin in jail maintained the tension in the show, which made it impossible to look away. My heart leapt in my throat when Matt started talking about Vanessa, the last person that screwed with Fisk, and Vanessa in season one ended up without a head. When Fisk finally explodes and attacks Matt, I was genuinely afraid for him. Although I knew nothing too bad would happen to him, great performances and monologue by both Charlie Cox and Vincent D'Onofrio. There's a slow unraveling of Daredevil 2. His conversation with Claire on the roof shows how demoralized he seems. The Punisher's hits on the DA and the dude in the hotel, Fisk's control in jail, and Nobu's return has really affected Daredevil and has him questioning if what he's been doing has been useful at all. I think this scene was really important as it typifies Daredevil at the crossroads of whether he continues to do what he does or if he starts to be more ruthless and more like the Punisher. Speaking of which... I like the Punisher showing a very heroic side when he saved Karen from the spray of bullets when they first meet. It shows him willing to get shot over an innocent, and for that you have to admire him. Finally, the best teaser for the episode to come was the final scene, the hand scaling the hospital, the creepy kids awake, and a desperate daredevil putting his mask on to jump into the fray. The bust of fluorescent lights in the hospital and the children of the damned are straight out of a horror film, and I love it. Can't wait for the next episode. Kind regards, Ronaldo. Well, I can say nothing but absolutely agree with you Ronaldo on the uh the creepy kids um and that absolutely uh one of my favorite parts of this episode uh, I, as you say it just builds for the next episode what are they going to do what are the hand going to do who are scaling those hospital walls you know is it to kill them is it to cure them i you know or bring them back into the fold yeah. and continue with what they're doing um you know what's going to happen here are they too dangerous or are they too prized um i i'm really interested to see that um the monologue in prison fantastic um, i like the idea as well about whether we are going to see a more ruthless um daredevil you certainly have those depictions of daredevil mm -hmm. being more ruthless in in the comics and that so that could be a really interesting thing you know he does walk that fine line to um being good and and letting the devil out uh the devil inside yeah so that was really good and yeah, I mean, having Claire Temple back is just like great. She is a fantastic um, addition to Daredevil, Absolutely. where she certainly gets more screen time and just across all the different uh, Marvel Netflix uh, series that I've heard to date. Yeah, and just kind of, I'm. There's nothing much more I can say with I agree with the, what the guy said and what you're on your feedback. Thank you, Ronaldo, for the feedback. Yep, thanks very much for the feedback, Ronaldo. If you want to send in your feedback, as I mentioned, just email us at feedback at defenderstvpodcast.com or come and join us over on our group, uh, facebook.com slash group slash Defenders TV podcast. Then come back and join us next week, obviously, for our uh, 11th episode of Daredevil. Only three more left to go, boys. I know. I know. But next up, we're going to be talking about Civil War. If you haven't seen Civil War, this will be spoiler filled. So uh, join us for episode 11. Dot 380 uh, next week uh, or go watch the film and then come back and listen to the last bit uh, first off Chris you didn't get to join us on her spoiler filled uh, Civil War podcast so I have a basic inkling of what your thoughts of Civil War are <laughs> I know you enjoyed it overall yep I'm not even gonna lie I'm not even gonna kind of do a pretense it's I enjoyed the hell out of this cool. film I really did there was just so much to it there was so many there were so many nods to the book that it, we were all worried of how they were going to do this element or how the story arc, and they mm -hmm. did it well. Spider-Man was fantastically absolutely. introduced. My God, thank God we didn't see Uncle Ben die again. <laughs> absolutely. I was, I was, if we had, I was going to cry. We have hot Aunt May now as well, so that's grand. Yes, oh, hot I, Aunt I love May. the guesses that actually it's Uncle Tony now in this universe. Uh. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that would be amazing. <laughs> They're great. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and then Ant-Man we knew it was coming from leaks on Lego years ago I actually got I actually got that from the Lego Marvel game uh, it gave us an Ant-Man um, Ant-Man pack and it had uh, it had giant Ant-Man in it I was going I wonder what this is for <laughs> and it was about three or four yeah. months ago yeah yeah. they gave Lego mini figs mm -hmm. as well brilliant um, with, with the, the airport scene. but it still loved it and like some of the quips such as like the the old 70s film you know the Star Wars <laughs> one you know Empire Strikes Back I was like come on that was just classified. it's how I feel sometimes talking with you Chris nah, I'm not going <laughs> to say anything on that it's alright granddad <laughs> 
I, 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 I don't want to kind of belabor the point. I just, I loved it. And um, I'll happily chat to any of the guys on the Facebook group uh, or um, via our page about anything they want to talk about regarding this. Um, because, yeah, I could gush for hours, but I wanted to hold off until we had mm. this discussion. So overall, I think I started off the podcast last week with our full Spoiler Filled podcast, um, asking the question of John as well. Uh, so I want to ask you too. I know you're you're always Team Tony. I know you're an Iron Man fanatic. What, how, did that change during the course of the film? Did you come out as still on the side of Iron Man? Do you think they did a good job presenting both sides? Overall, I think they belaboured some of Tony's points a bit too much uh, in that they kind of tried to show him as the man who cared about the innocence and uh, et cetera, et cetera, like all that kind of the Sarkovia Accords and that's this is why and then with uh, Miriam and the the fact that the son had died in Sarkovia mm-hmm. and he starts feeling all this, he then goes and like just destroys like half of an airport. Maybe just take a step <laughs> back and like, and then when they're trying to capture... Winter Soldier and Black Panther's chasing him and he thinks of Budapest. I, I think that was again like they were like let's try and not destroy everything we're superheroes and like how many cars got destroyed in that tunnel Absolutely. people? But, but they're all Audis it's okay. <laughs> yeah did you know they were Audis? Yep. Oh my god. It's just like Bond now you know that's what happens in big chase sequences they just get the rights to a one car company and five cars so they can sell them after the movie but uh but hey if it got that airport fight sequence made I don't care if they sell if they yeah, sold their okay. souls to the sure. devil uh, <laughs> that airport fight sequence mm-hmm. was fantastic absolutely loved it yeah as to whether I still agreed with it towards the end of the mm-hmm. film because he started using the raft at the very end I felt bad yeah. for him I I'm very curious to see what the brothers do with the rest of the universe. The Russos, yeah. Um, yeah. Because you've got a shattered Avengers now. Literally, you've got the new Avengers and the Avengers. I didn't think they'd do this. Which, after Civil War in the comic books, you had two mm-hmm. Avengers. Uh, well, you had the official and then you had the... the, the, the That's the one, Avengers. Chris. Secret Avengers. Yeah, I said new, I yeah. said new Avengers. Sorry, excuse yeah, me. Secret exactly. Avengers. So Cap leaves the, uh, the burner phone behind him to effectively say, you can call us if you need us, Tony. We are still a team. We are the Secret Avengers. Very cool little touch. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And who's on the Secret Avengers? Doctor Strange. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Eventually becomes a member of the yeah. new Avengers. And he's a defender. So is he the connective glue like Nick Fury was uh, for Phase 3? Oh, sore point. Yeah. Sore point. Yeah, maybe. But, but yeah. Nick Fury or will, will they come together Nick because Fury of Strange Tales? Yeah. That's what I want. That would be pretty cool if we had Nick Fury and Doctor Strange coming together. And they can do a period piece with 1602. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Chris, any other thoughts about Civil War? I had a few just quick kind of pieces I wanted to bring up. Easter egg slash kind of I thought mm-hmm. were cool. Um, so when Tony's making the speedy exit from uh, the Dean of MIT, which is the, the none other than Dean from Community, which oh, I yeah. love. Jim Rass, awesome. Um, film, yeah. yeah. Uh, he runs into Alfre uh, Woodard, who plays a woman called Miriam. Mm-hmm. Uh, she works for the State Department and her son was killed in Sarkovia. And it was great. That, that was a crux, uh, very much the beginning of this, the, the Civil War. Um, but I can't help but wonder if there's a hidden meaning to the, her character name. Um, because in the, the, the credits, she's only just kind of uh, named mm-hmm. as Miriam. But in the actual comic books, there's a very outspoken supporter of the Superhero Human Registration Act. Which it was the Civil War part of the Sokovia Accords. They're the same, and her name is Miriam Sharp. Right. She and it's well like you've probably seen it in the comic book. She spits in mm-hmm. Tony's face, and so a very iconic kind of image. I remember. I remember her being the character that Tony went back to quite a few times to kind of reinvigorate his belief in the Registration Act. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, could be how she continues mm-hmm. on more and more in the Good universe. Good catch, Chris. Good catch. Although we know that Alfie Woodard is going to be in uh, Luke Cage, it's definitely confirmed it's a different character, has a very different role in uh, in Luke Cage, which is one of the first times in quite a while that an actress has appeared in the Marvel Cinematic Universe films and is going to appear in another property with a different character name. It's been mm. quite a while since that happened. Uh, Chris Evans as Human Torch, anyone? <laughs> uh, so the next point I wanted to bring up was uh, the Dora Milaje. 
it was another nice nod to people who probably read a lot of Black Panther when uh, T'Challa is released from mm-hmm. custody and Widow's kind of walking from to the car. There's um, a woman accompanying mm-hmm. him, and she's kind of slightly, slightly skinhead. Very cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this was being that they're the the his warrior bodyguards, the female warrior bodyguards. And like they they they've had the widow and the bodyguards have had some run-ins oh, really? and like yeah like so this was great just to see it and I was like oh they're gonna show the massive kick in the oh it's gonna be... no, no they didn't. <laughs> but a great line from Black Panther uh, as much as I'd like to see that uh, play out <laughs> yeah <laughs> step out of the way exactly really good but ultimately um, I can do this all day. Mm-hmm. What a great oh, absolutely great great to see that all the way all the way from the first um from the first bully scene from uh, captain america first avenger uh, all the way through to there yeah really good now this is what i'm gonna bring up which potentially could mean absolutely nothing okay. or it could be just something quite fantastic a tie into agent carter and i'm not talking about mm-hmm. agent carter <laughs> um or howard stark or Harry Stark, or any of them. No, uh, this was Bucky's ex girlfriend is mentioned as being Dot. Really interesting. Yes. Wow. So we we've gone back and we've discussed this off air, and I just yeah, I was pretty sure that it was uh, Dot was the girlfriend that he met at uh, the Stark Expo before he shipped out to uh, to World War Two, but that's not correct, is it, Chris? No, that her name is Connie. Right. Yeah, so Dot is someone completely different. Interesting. So, we do know that uh, uh, Peggy was around. Could it be none other than Dotty? Bridget Regan was the girlfriend of, of Winter Soldier before he became Winter Soldier. Mm-hmm. Interesting. <laughs> Could it be? It's a what? Like, the, how many Dots are there in the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Mm-hmm. Like, come on. Like, they're, they're just, they, they kind of... I, I think this is very much a nice... That would be so cool. It would. Yeah. Especially since we may not get Agent Carter Season Mm 3. Like, this could be like, oh my God, this is how they ended it. Yeah. With one final tie-in. Absolutely. And that is definitely a point I made on the podcast last week. One of the points, obviously, about losing both Peggy and Howard after doing two seasons of of Agent Carter and they finally make the close there. The involvement of the scriptwriters in this show and as as creators of those characters and kind of having the death of them basically about a week before the announcement of whether a season three is coming or not uh, was a really interesting uh, timing I suppose for mm. for that for that particular moment um as we record this episode there is by about 24 hours before we know for definite whether there will be a season three of Agent Carter so probably by the time I have this episode eight uh, we will know whether we get, are getting a season three yay or a season two oh oh uh, should we take a vote do we like, think in terms of what do we think okay well, a bet I'm going, no, I would love yes, but I think I don't think they're going to renew. Okay, John? I'm going to be optimistic and say yes. I'm thinking it's going to be Marvel's Most Wanted is going to be this season, and potentially we will see a season three, but it may not be in its normal slot. So it might go into a summer slot, or it might go into uh, later on in the year. Okay, That's okay, okay. That could, that could be. Because I was going, like, Marvel's Most Wanted was most likely was more because it's fresh, it's new. I thought that would probably get picked up and then a Carter would be kind of relegated to some kind of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. slash Marvel's Most Wanted kind of tie-ins every now and again. Mm. I think I have a feeling that if Hayley Atwell isn't getting another season, that that is the last we've seen of Agent Carter. I don't think she's going to be coming back in anything else now. That's that's her, her final obligation now uh, has been fulfilled in the movie universe uh, I think if she, if we're not getting a season three of Agent Carter, we've probably seen the last of Agent Carter of Haley Atwell yeah. in that role. True, they did kill her off, literally. Exactly. I can't, I can't see much unless Doctor Strange takes place in 1985 and we see a different version of uh, of Peggy Carter in there. I can't see how they're going to fit her back into the movie universe. So, anything else about Civil War before we go into a little bit of feedback about it? Nothing from my side, but if anyone wants to have a chat with me more about what I thought about Spider-Man, being a Spidey fan, huge one, mm-hmm. or etc, cetera, etc, cetera, please feel free to come over and talk to all three of us on the Facebook group. Absolutely, absolutely. A uh, little bit of feedback that we got in uh, after our spoiler-filled podcast about Civil War. Uh, 
Ronaldo says he really enjoyed Hawkeye 2. Uh, to me, he's like the everyday man up against the superhumans, like if Daredevil were to tangle with the Avengers. I love how without hesitation, Hawkeye would take on Vision or Black Panther, even when they were way above him in terms of strength and power. One of my favorite Avengers in this movie. Definitely uh, really liked him in this. And Black Widow as well. I, re- I really liked her. Uh, yes, you know, both of them super skilled, but mm-hmm. ultimately not superheroed. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Really enjoyed the duplicity in in, uh, in Black Widow's character in this film, having to make the real choice between the two sides just because two of them are our best friends. You know, really interesting. Yeah, no, completely agree on this. Ronaldo also goes on to say, uh, just to touch on your opening discussion, I was always a Team Cap person, but during and after Civil War, I questioned this due to RDJ's great performance, which lent, lent itself to so much empathy and the intelligent script by the writers. They succeeded in pre- presenting two fair sides of the argument, which I think is, as, has made it a great Marvel film and one which puts the Captain America trilogy on top of the pile. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I have to say Robert Downey Jr.'s performance, fantastic. Um, I like the fact that I was listening to another podcast by our friends over at Welcome to Level 7 where they talked about um, the fact that there's no conflict here for, for Cap. He starts out at the beginning of the film with his beliefs and by the end of the film it doesn't change. And they saw it as a bit of a, 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 a poor uh, writing choice, I suppose. I love the fact that, Ch- that Cap himself has always gone from a moral center right the way from the first of this trilogy of films right the way through to now. He's always known what his heart, uh, what his heart has decided. He always knows it's the right way to go and he always stands behind it. And just that little push from Peggy Carter, uh, through Sharon Carter in her speech, uh, at the, or her eulogy, I suppose, at the funeral of Peggy Carter, just that push is all he needs to keep on that side. But I love that he doesn't question his decision at any point. He knows he's in the right from his perspective he does apologize to tony if he's if he's hurt him in the past but that's about it i like that 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 was the decision that they made for him um i am still team cap for his reasons i'm also team iron man for his reasons because i think they're also quite personal and quite uh there are good reasons to to have some form of control yeah no i'm team iron man yep still team iron man sorry agree but still team iron man cooler suit um yeah bleeding edge Thank you, Ronaldo, for the the feedback. And um, certainly, I thought like uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s performance was pretty dark and brooding. It was really good, but I, I think on the same uh, vein, I think uh, Chris Evans uh, really um, just acted so well uh, to that as well. Um, you know, you know, just echoing the thing that he said, you know, when he's getting beaten up in um, Captain America First Avenger where I could do this all day, you know, that's such a great little moment. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I thought both their performances really good and, and in the same way that I would have had some sympathy definitely with Captain America's uh, choice here and mm-hmm. um, definitely in response to that Rebecca also says I think it's hard to top Iron Man in the Iron Man movie verse but Civil War is probably Robert Downey Jr.'s best MCU performance oh so I'm going to completely agree with Rebecca here on this um, I think and to, to, the, to the point that like this is Robert Downey Jr.'s best performance over perhaps number three and number one uh-huh. to the point as well where he Robert Downey Jr. is now confirmed he'll pretty much do a fourth uh-huh. Iron Man and I'd say this is what drove him back that he was bored and then this has given him the the, the tenacity and the, uh, the, the the love of the character again mm-hmm yeah, absolutely. Uh, Rebecca also goes on to say, I think all sides in this film are fighting for family. For Tony, Widow and Vision, the Avengers of the family. Whilst the same is true for Steve, Bucky is real family. And Sam will always go with Steve. T'Challa and Zemo are also fighting on behalf of family. And that's what makes the film have heart. Um, and obviously, this is why uh, Natalia... Uh, Romanov is torn. She just wants Avengers to stay together more than, um, more fragmentation. Uh, really good, um, spot there in terms of that kind of theme running through Civil War. And again, as such, Civil War anyway, pitting family against family, Absolutely. brother against brother, sister against sister, cat against cat, dog <laughs> against dog, yeah. goldfish against goldfish. Uh, yeah, really good point, Rebecca. I really enjoy the, the idea of this all being about family. Uh, the fact that Natasha does have that problem where she's come from a background of being a black widow, so her her family has been stripped away from her at a young age. She's then gone in and joined S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, along with Barton, who are her family. S.H.I.E.L.D. broke apart. 
beforehand. Um, yeah, totally understand. That's a really, it's a really good point seeing it, uh, seeing it from that family point of view. Um, yeah, really good. And finally, uh, Wu says the funniest joke that didn't have any dialogue in the film was Sam Wilson and Bucky Barnes looking at Captain Rogers out the windshield and nodding as he kisses uh, Sharon Carter. Underneath the arches. Uh, underneath Absolutely. The arches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really good. Uh, thanks so much for all the feedback uh, that we've gotten. Again, we have had a few other bits of pe- feedback over on the Facebook group. Come join that, facebook.com slash groups slash Defenders TV podcast. If you want to send in any thoughts on any of our episodes or any thoughts about the podcast itself, pop them on over to feedback at Defenders TV podcast.com. Uh, about that time, we put the call out to see if you'll give us an old review over on iTunes. Uh, to get to our iTunes link, just go to iTunes and search for it defenders tv podcast or go through our direct link at defenders tv podcast.com slash itunes leave us an old review let us know uh, whether we're doing a good job and whether you're enjoying the episodes absolutely i uh, really would love your feedback and especially just the review <laughs> the more <laughs> reviews we get the more the more fellow defenders we can have in the group mm-hmm. the more, and then that means even more people that we like-minded who can argue the toss about which is better spider-man in the iron armist or spider-man in the traditional or mcu spider-man uh-huh. absolutely who knows <laughs> Absolutely, or or whether um, Doctor Strange was ever in Secret Avengers. He was. Interesting. We'll save that discussion for the next episode. Thanks so much for joining us, listeners. We'll talk to you again next time. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See you guys. Bye. Bye. Are you guys hearing the screaming uh, on the mic? No. Okay, no. Grant, okay. No, like, there's a couple having a full-on fight <laughs> scream <laughs> outside the window, and I can see them, and, like, she's beaten out of him, but I keep hearing the screams, and I'm like, is that coming through on the mic? But it's not, it's Grant. Okay, it's good. It might, be, it might come through on your side, on your mic, but we get nothing fed through other than what's what you're actually saying directly into the microphone, so... Okay, Grant, this is fine, as long as it's... Yeah, but sometimes we hear the buses, so it can't be. No, that's only on. Well, usually only on Chris's. When version I'm of talking, it. Uh, okay. yeah. When I, no, no. When when Chris sends me the version of it, I'll hear it when I'm editing. Okay, Grant. I just okay. wanted to make sure that you, we're not hearing how many people having a massive fight and screaming. That's but fine. Can I can I just say that is the most disturbing question I've ever heard on the <laughs> podcast? Can you guys hear the screaming? I know. I was like going. Oh, going hold on. on. Oh wait, actually, hold on. Wait. Okay. okay, now two other lads got involved and there's four of them fighting. Yay, I love my area. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, to, welcome to Hell's Kitchen. Yeah. It, it, it's Hell's Canteen. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, Jesus. All right, anyway, sorry, continue, John.